And good morning. Another chilly day in Houston. My name is Randy Price. Uh, he is Matt Price. We are the Price Group, and uh, we're privileged to have you uh, join us for our ongoing educational series, a webinar that we've entitled Creating Income for Retirement. Retirement is all about income. Everybody needs a wealth coach, and uh, we think there are uh, a lot of uh, planning and details that go into a successful retirement. And uh, we are going to try to give you a glimpse of some of the things that you should be aware of, be considering and planning for as you make that all important step out of a job, paying you every uh, every couple of weeks to uh, your second childhood and enjoying retirement. Uh, uh, who are we? The Price Group, family owned and operated. Uh, the most important thing there, we do follow a fiduciary standard, and our business is focused on uh, folks just like you if uh, you're within five years of retirement. So uh, with that, as we uh, go ahead and get started uh, uh, with uh, about our firm, Matt, tell us a little bit about Steward Partners. Steward Partners, based off the biblical definition of stewardship, a little over $30 billion as a, a firm as the end of 2023. Raymond James is one of our two custodians, custodians meaning just where client assets are held. The other is Pershing. Uh, Raymond James has been a great partner. Hard to believe Randy and I have been here with Steward Partners uh, coming up on, on six years. It, it feels just like yesterday, but uh, it's been a great place for our clients, uh, employee owned and operated, which we think is a, a key to, to keeping all interest aligned. Uh, a little bit about us, Randy's been recognized by Barron's, Forbes, Financial Times. We haven't updated this slide, but just the end of last week, uh, we got a Forbes Best in State Wealth Management Team Award for the first time, which we were really humbled by. Randy and I both certified financial planners. Maddie Kearns, uh, who will be promoted to an advisor uh, later this spring, also a certified financial planner. And uh, we think education is is really important in, in this industry. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we've got a couple of brain teasers. We're going to look at the markets. Uh, we're going to talk about the top five risk of retirement. Retirement is all about income and it's all about risk management. Uh, how do you produce income uh, is uh, is an important topic as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about our approach to be a financially uh, live well in retirement. Uh, we call what we do a live well plan. And so let's go ahead and uh, and, and get started here. Cool. Matthew? But, you know, people attend these webinars for, for different reasons. We see a few familiar faces that have attended a, a number of our educational events over the years, a, a few new names. So we're glad glad you're here, but we think there's there's a whole host of reasons of why you signed up and, and decided to log in, but we think it boils down to that, that bottom sentence. We think everyone's looking for the three C's, clarity, comfort, and confidence as it pertains to your retirement. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. When we look back at the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, you know, name any decade, there's always going to be uncertainty as it pertains to geopolitical tensions, the economy, interest rates, go down the list. And, and we think the what we're trying to obtain for clients is, are the three C's. We're trying to give them comfort and confidence and clarity uh, as it pertains to their retirement. So uh, warming up the brain a little bit, what was the annualized total return for the S&P 500, the overall stock market in the decade of the 30s? A, 0, 0.0, B, down 3%, C, down 7 or D, just up 2% per year? And drum roll, please, it actually was 0, 0.0%. Uh, yeah, the market uh, did very poorly. First couple of years uh, with the Great Depression, et cetera. And uh, then it was uh, the United States gearing up for entering the war toward the end of the 30s that really got the economy humming. And so, uh, again, uh, that goes down as one of the few decades where stocks really haven't made uh, uh, a meaningful return uh, for the uh, for the investor. Okay, so, let's get to the market overview. 
those of you that are Yankee fans, uh, this is uh, always uh, yogi-isms, as they're called. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, as many times as I read that, uh, uh, I still get a get a kick out of that. Uh, uh, Matt, bull and bear markets, the, the answer is only invest when they're going up, right? Just kidding. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this chart. A little bit busy, but a lot of information here uh, that uh, pertains uh, important from a long to, for a long term perspective. Yeah, I want to draw your attention. You know, green is good, red is bad here, but we want to look at kind of what is the average duration of a bull market, and and we look here from looking uh, you know the the four, late forties through the late 60s, early 70s, your bull market was almost 24 years. More recently here, from the 80s to the end of the 90s, about a 17 year bull market. Uh, when, when we look back at history, these bull markets tend to last anywhere from 15 to 25 years. So we, we don't think we're in the ninth inning. You can see here kind of toward the end, we've categorized this as red based off of 2022. Some could make an argument that 2022 was just kind of a setback in the current bull market. A lot of economists are kind of divided over, over if it's a, a new bull market or a continuing one. But overall, uh, stocks tend to go up. We think you need to own stocks as at least a part of your retirement portfolio. We'll talk about that in more detail. And, and Randy said earlier, but retirement really is an income-driven exercise. We think if you do own stocks, we need to focus on companies that not only pay dividends, but have historically increased dividends year over year. And for the yeah. bonds or the fixed income, uh, this, this slide could look dated, but we left it in here on purpose. We, we've kind of been saying for a number of years, our bonds actually safe. And when we look back to 2022, bonds had a really crummy total return uh, year. Interest rates went up, bond prices went down. Interest rates are starting at a much higher spot going into 2024, which should be some tailwind for bond investors. But uh, the, the point we bring up is this, investing in non-stock securities, bonds, CDs, corporate bonds, whatever it might be, it's a lot more involved than it was 10, 15 years ago. So we, we think you need to own, know what you own and not only have a process on the stock side, but also have a process for the bonds or the fixed income that you own. And Matt, the, uh, the important thing here is we're measuring a real return, and that is the return after inflation. I remember uh, people talking about, well, the good old days when you know interest rates were double digits, and well, you had double digit inflation as well. So at the end of the day, you were paying taxes, but not really moving the needle. And we found out here recently what happens uh, when the inflation genie gets out, then we can run into some real problems uh, because it's not just a raw number of an interest rate or a dollar in your bank account, but what it will buy. What will a new car cost? What will a mortgage cost? What will groceries cost? Uh, we hear all the time about, well, you know, have you seen how much eggs are at the grocery store? And uh, wow, they've sure sure gone higher. So if you make a 6% um, rate of return and you've got 4% inflation, your real rate of return is actually only 2%. two so that's something that's very important over time because we're not um, uh, measuring just numbers or percentages, but we're measuring your ability to live, your ability to take vacation, your ability to uh, to put food on the table, et cetera, on a relative basis on what it's been. So uh, yeah, bonds uh, can be uh, dangerous. Uh, and again, you need a process, as you just said, Matt, to, to manage the fixed income uh, bonds, as well as the equities, the stocks in the portfolio. So what are the top five risks of retirement, uh, you asked? Retirement risk number one, living too long. You uh, read stories on a regular basis on uh, people are living to a certain age. Well, congratulations. 
uh, you can look there if you uh, you're uh, uh, male. You have a uh, 78 chance, 78 percent chance of making a 75. If you're a couple, it's 97 percent. And so that really makes the point for us that this is all about uh, both spouses and the money lasting throughout retirement. And even uh, about half the people, one of the spouse makes it to uh, to age to age 90. Again, a key planning concept, uh, especially when you deal with inflation. Speaking of inflation, uh, sometimes called the hidden tax, the buying power of $100, look how that comes that, that comes down at 1% inflation all the way down to 10% inflation. An interesting sort of cowboy math way of looking at how long it takes your cost of living to double is what we call the rule of 72. If you have uh, divide the inflation rate into 72 and you get a number. So if you have 4% inflation, the cost, of inf the cost of living will double every 18 years. If you have 6% inflation, the cost of living will double every 12 years. So you can see if you retire at 60, 62 and you get a double of inflation by 74, the cost of living could have doubled. Then by 84, the cost of living could have doubled again. So that's why it's important to own some inflation sensitive, if you will, investments typically those have been uh those have been equities but uh to take into account inflation the real dollar that you have to spend after you factor in the hidden tax which is inflation a big deal and again that rule of 72 put that in your pocket as far as uh, a good way to be thinking about uh, that retirement risk number three is is market performance uh, we've got uh, uh, a box top left, a box bottom left. And what happens is we have a uh, average rate of return of 7%. Now we mix up the returns in the top left box. You see, we start out with a negative 15% rate of return, a lot of sevens. And then the green is a positive 29%. Start out with 100,000, you get to $188,399. Bottom, you flip the good and the bad year. Year one is a positive 29%. Year 10 is a negative 15%. And what happens? You have the same amount of money, $188,399. Sequence has no effect on returns in the accumulation phase where you've been all these years. But Matt, sequence of return has a dramatic effect in the distribution phase. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so shift our attention from the two left boxes to the two right. Same starting value of 100000 but we're taking a $10,000 per year withdrawal, increased by 3% each year for inflation. And what you see in that top right-hand box with a bad or a poor return in the first year, you run out of money in this made-up example somewhere between years 9 and 10. However, in the bottom right-hand box, uh, if you start out with a good return, the plus 29% in year one, you still have over $50,000 left at the end of the 10th year. So what does this all mean? This means that sequence of returns is not something fun or good to talk about at a cocktail party, but it is very important for your retirement planning. And so we see, as you would imagine, a lot of engineers from the some of the integrated oil companies here in Houston come in with these really bona fide beefed up spreadsheets. But a lot of them use just a linear rate of return, uh, 4%, 5%, 6% in retirement. And, and, and that we don't think is adequate to give your family a good probability of success because that doesn't take into account having some bad market returns in the first few years. So what we use is called Monte Carlo simulation. We simulate each couple family individual going through retirement a thousand times. And we spit out a probability of success based on those trials. And so what that does, it takes into account the years that you have some poor market performance in the first one, two, three, four, five years see how that looks doing it over a thousand different times. Again, comfort, clarity, and confidence. Uh, if we can, through this planning, give you clarity, that clarity is going to lead to comfort. 
uh, is going to, uh, by the way of confidence. So uh, again, this is all a process. Uh, market performance, uh, if you have a 10% loss in your portfolio and you are not taking any money out, only, it only takes a 11% rate of return to get back even. If you have a 20% rate, a 20% downdraft, a loss in the portfolio, um, and it takes 36% to uh, to get back even. So the key in retirement is you want to minimize the downdraft, minimize the down years, make your bad sort of like golf, make your bad bad periods uh, better and not uh, not get beat up as much. Uh, and as we say down there, if you have a twenty percent loss while you're withdrawing four percent with three percent inflation, you need a thirty six percent gain to recover your initial loss. So your ability uh to to take a loss in your retirement portfolio once you start distribution goes lower so it's more important to have a process it's more important to have some procedures in place both on stocks both on bonds to minimize that portfolio loss we know there's going to be portfolio losses like 2022 when the uh, when the market was down over 18% Bonds were down also, but uh, again, if you can hold your own during the bad periods, you can uh, you can get back to even much quicker and and participate going higher. So uh, we think the fourth major risk for your consideration in retirement is investing without a process. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but the gray line is the S and P five hundred, the overall stock market. And the lighter shades of blue are when money is flowing into stock, mutual funds, and ETFs, and then when money is flowing out. And, and what you can see here is the average retail investor has historically just been wrong. Uh, look at the late 90s. You have the highest inflow into stocks, which arguably was the worst time to buy stocks in the last 30 or so years. But the two highlighted areas in red below when stocks were down in 2000, 2001, and 2002, you see there were there was mass selling at the end of 2002, and then we all remember more recently the end of 2008, early 2009, from peak to trough, the stock market was down approximately 50%. Stocks were on sale, yet people were selling stocks at that point. So uh, th this is when emotions get in the way of rational behavior, uh, we, we think it is a, a, it is good counsel, have an investment process, know what you own, know why you own it, and uh, have someone to hold you accountable if, if you are someone that potentially could, could get emotional when, when markets do gyrate. So a process is critical, and uh, again, process for fixed income, a process for, for stocks, a process for planning. Uh, Healthcare. Uh, this one's sort of self-explanatory. Everybody is well aware that if you've uh, been to the emergency room or the doctor or the hospital, uh, how expensive healthcare has been. And so um, uh, this study is a little bit dated, but uh, the average couple will spend over three hundred thousand in healthcare and medical expenses throughout retirement. Uh, and so it's very important to factor in a buffer, if you will. For, uh, for healthcare, uh, that's retirement risk number five. So we've got all these risks. We've got all these uncertainties. Uh, how does someone uh, looking to retirement uh, start uh, to do so? Well, number one, we think it's very important to create a retirement roadmap. Uh, we've talked about process, process, process. If uh, what you're going to do and you're going to look at retirement is not written down, it's not a meaningful plan. And that is mainly a look at cash flow and investment planning. But how much can you spend in retirement? Will your money last? What rate of return do you need? And uh, more importantly, how much income do I need to produce? And so the price group, uh, we call what we do a live well plan. Uh, everybody wants to live well but it's the nuts and the bolts. It's the actual putting some elbow grease into numbers and then being able to play a what if scenario to uh, to create this retirement roadmap. Very important, the foundational 
uh, and probably the most important one of the things we call our secret sauce on what we do for folks as they get near retirement. So step number two, we think you should stress test your portfolio, and this is twofold. Uh, the first is a little harder to kind of uh, maybe put put your arms around it from a numbers perspective, but how are you going to emotionally handle a potential loss in your portfolio? And then second, can your retirement plan recover from a 20%, 30%, 40% correction? Uh, Benjamin Graham, who was one of Warren Buffett's mentors, said, the essence of investment management is the management of risk, not the management of returns. A, a lot of people that come to see us who are kicking the tires, they they kind of maybe don't necessarily say this verbatim, but they insinuate, hey, the market's up 10%. I'm trying to be up 10.1%. And, and that's a fine, even in some situations, a good strategy while you are still working. But we need to shift the entire way we look at investing as you transition into retirement. And we've said it, I think now twice, retirement is an income driven exercise where we need to control risk a lot more on the downside. So we want to shift the mentality of how we look at uh, risk. And one of the ways we do that is just by stress testing the portfolio prior to retirement. Social Security can be an important part of your retirement income, and so uh, there are a lot of ways to take Social Security, uh, especially if you're if you're married. When do you start? Uh, do you uh, uh, take a look at starting one Social Security before the other? Uh, the longer you're going to live, tell me how long you're going to live, and we'll tell you the exact way. But uh, we again got a process here, an analysis for Social Security where we can give you a, a tool and answer any questions that you've got on when to take social security. Um, many times the answer is for the, uh, for the, for the husband to uh, wait as long as possible. Full retirement age is uh, uh, right at 67 years. And there's a big increase in social security waiting from 67 to 68, from 68 to 69, from 69 to 70. And uh, so, uh, you know, your Social Security statement and uh, uh, your spouse's Social Security statement are really important documents that we use during our Live Well plan and the preparation of this to give you advice, to give you some feedback on what your options are with regard to Social Security. So, uh, again, uh, don't just make a decision. Uh, look before you leap right there. Step number four, we think promote income tax efficiencies. There's one, if not two dozen different ways we we look to do this for, for clients in retirement. Um, so these gifting ideas, these are not all encompassing or holistic of how we promote income tax efficiencies. We just wanted to name a few as uh, an example. Uh, starting with the qualified charitable distribution or sometimes known as a QCD, the RMDs are the required minimum distribution, the amount you're required to take out of your IRA starting currently at age 73. They're going to work that up to 75 over the next number of years. Uh, you can actually, though, take this qualified charitable distribution starting at age 70 and a half. So you can give money directly from your IRA to any qualified 501c3 organization. You do not have to pay any ordinary income on that, and up to $100,000 can count toward your required minimum distribution. So it, it's a really great way for someone over the age of 70 and a half to, to charitably give. Uh, gifting of appreciated stocks, we, we get really busy the last couple of weeks of every year doing this for, for clients giving to their church or charity of choice. And so if you bought you know, make up an example, Apple stock at $100 and it's now worth $1,000, you can give that to the church or the charity. The church or the charity does not pay any capital gains and then you you don't pay any capital gains either and then you get credit for that gift uh, in, in the same way you get credit for just making a cash gift. The The third bunching of deductions is is becoming less and less usable just because they are increasing that standard deduction each year. 
but that is something where you itemize maybe in the odd years, you use the standard deduction, the even years. It's also limited because right now in the state of Texas, you have a $10,000 max on your SALT tax for your state and local taxes, which include your property taxes and any sales tax if you do itemize those as well. So not as, as accretive as it once was. Cash flow planning is, uh, is so very important. Many uh, of you perhaps have heard about the quote unquote 4% rule. The old rule said uh, invest in stocks and bonds. You can take 4% out, even going back at the most uh, uh, desperate times for the economy, your money still lasted. And uh, uh, we think that uh, the the 4% rule can be a rule of thumb, can be of help, but uh, given lower interest rates today relative to uh, years past, it's a it's a new period. And so there was an article that had a catchy title and we've sort of paraphrased that is 3%, the new 4%. Uh, uh, answer is perhaps. And so you can, a lot of times we'll have people say, well, the difference between three and four is just 1% or the difference between four and five is just 1%. But statistically, mathematically, uh, it is a big percentage, especially when magnified over the years, especially if you adjust it for inflation. So uh, uh, we work through cash flow planning. We spend a lot of time here. We think that it's very helpful if during retirement you can adopt some flexibility, take uh, perhaps a little bit more money out during good times and a little bit less money out during uh, bad times. But uh, you know, the rule of thumb is people will need 70 to 80% of their salary prior to retirement. Um, uh, we've talked about our live well plan. One of the neat things that it does is if we've prepared this for you. We give you the keys to the castle, so to speak, and you can go in and change inflation, change the rate of return, change how long you're going to live, change you're going to need more money here. And so you can play the what if scenario, which is very helpful, again, as we talk about the three C's, clarity, clarity leads to confidence, confidence leads to comfort. And uh, again, that's what, in, uh, that's what retirement planning is all about. So we think step number six, we got two slides here. We think having an income oriented investment process is paramount. What we're looking at here is each column is a different decade. And the blue portion of the column is the percentage of the return that came from dividends. And, and what you can see is it's a substantial, substantial amount, some decades more, more than others. But uh, we think moving forward, dividends continue to be a big part uh, or should be a, a big part or at least considered for a retiree's investment portfolio. And here's why. When we look back at history, dividend growth stocks have outperformed dividend paying stocks, which have outperformed the overall market. These numbers were from the mid 80s through the end of 2022. And uh, what I mean by dividend growth stocks, these are companies that not only pay dividends, but historically have increased their dividends year over year. And so we think if you want to boil down our investment process to one thing on the stock side, it would be we're looking for companies that not only pay those dividends, but historically have had a propensity to increase the dividends year over year. It uh, serves two real uh, goals that we have. Number one, they've, they've grown, as you can see. But number two, Randy mentioned over 80% of our clients are retired. Uh, and retirees need income for, for living expenses, gifts, travel, go down the list of things uh, to, to spend money on. A lot of folks will ask about long-term care. Perhaps uh, you've done your planning and this is the only, if you will, surprise that could throw a monkey wrench into uh, getting from here to there uh, in a good way. But uh, in 2018, the average... Uh, stay in a nursing home or long-term care facility was uh, was three years. Uh, it had grown to about three and a half. So uh, there is a couple of different ways to look at this, planning for the long-term care. One is to ask the insurance company 
to take care of this risk or a portion of this risk. And uh, we'll uh, share those numbers with the client when, uh, when interested. Uh, for other clients, lots of times living in their house, their residence, acts as an inflation-sensitive investment. And uh, uh, before uh, that residence is sold, is someone would make the transition to a long-term care uh, or nursing facility, and that money is used sort of as the piggy bank to provide for long-term care. So again, uh, all of these steps are critical. Uh, all these steps are part of the process. All these steps should be evaluated and uh, and looked at uh, before you take you make the decision to retire. Step number eight: uh, consider hiring an advisor. Uh, we've talked about emotions uh, during the investment process, and emotions can, uh, it's been proved to make, uh, help, help investors make bad decisions, and mistakes are obviously much more costly with a larger, uh, with a larger account uh, as, you, uh, as you get to retirement. Stress reductions, um, additional investment options, and uh, it's interesting, um, one of the big mutual fund companies did a, uh, did a study and showed that the average investor there in the red, uh, because of buying high and selling low, had, uh, had underperformed uh, the market. Um, there was a manager of uh, one of the famous mutual funds who was asked a question this uh, manager had a very long-term record and they said, uh, uh, what uh, is your, your biggest regret about your tenure in managing this, this huge mutual fund? At that time, it was one of the largest, if not the largest mutual fund in the world. Again, big name, a uh, lot of assets. And I think the person asking that question was thinking, well, I should have bought fill in the blank, Google or Apple or some stock. Uh, that had done very well and the manager very quickly sna snapped back and said uh, not snap back but just replied he said uh, the average return for each investor has nowhere been the average return for the fund and mutual funds can show uh, what percentage of investors get in if you will high and sell low and uh, he was disappointed that he had done such a good job, but the average investor had missed out because of emotional buying and then emotional selling without having a long-term plan. So we think our process is, is unique for a few reasons. Uh, we'd love to go over this in more detail as it pertains to your personal situation, but we think in retirement, you need more than just an investment guy. A lot of people in Houston, help with the stocks and bonds, what we find is not all of them help with the holistic financial planning. And you can see what that includes, the estate planning, the cash flow, the insurance, retirement tax planning, obviously the investments as, as well. Back to Benjamin Graham, we think the best way to measure your investing success is not whether you're beating the market, but by whether you've put in place a financial plan and behavioral discipline that are likely to get you where you want to go. So we think that's the cornerstone to success in retirement. That's where the rubber meets the road. A lot of people in our industry don't do all of that just because it is kind of the harder part, uh, or the, at least at the, at the minimum, the more time consuming part. But we think that's really our value add and uh, why clients tend to stick around once they do hire us. Uh, a big part of that is developing a family index number. What rate of return do you need in retirement? You could have worked at the same company as your neighbor across the street for 34 and a half years, and it could have two completely family different, different family index numbers. So this is not a cookie cutter. We slap the same thing on for everyone. We're looking at your spending. We're looking at your risk tolerance. We're looking at goals, objectives, go down the list. And uh, we're trying to take the least amount of risk possible for you to be successful. Why? Because we said earlier, retirement, we think, is about limit, limiting downside risk, not trying to outperform some arbitrary index uh, year over year. And so that's that's the live well plan. Uh, 
back to Randy's three C's. Um, sometimes I think he wishes he was an old Baptist pastor. Clarity, comfort, and confidence. That's what we're going for. And, uh, you know, at the very least, uh, our promise is if you do end up scheduling a meeting with us and we don't end up working together, you'll leave a more educated consumer on your own personal situation. But Randy, talk to us here next to last slide on uh, maybe what people should be looking for if they are interviewing a few advisors. Yeah, by the way, we do have a complimentary guide that includes 10 questions you should ask your financial advisor. Um, the thing that uh, we made a change uh, for, uh, six years ago was uh, it is so much more fun to sit on the side of the client as a fiduciary. Uh, does the current advisor represent you or represent the firm they work at? Uh, do they have a transparent call structure? Uh, what is the experience uh, of the individual or the team supporting you? We are big uh, advocates of, uh, of a team. More heads, more eyes are better than one. Uh, when you need a doctor, and you have a heart problem, you don't approach a doctor that does gallbladders on Tuesday, uh, hips on Wednesday, and, and gets around to uh, uh, hearts on Thursday or Friday, but you want someone that works in that area all the time. And uh, our team has, uh, has expertise in it in and a, uh, a niche in the retirement planning. Uh, as you've talked about, Matt, we do a, a personal planning it's not a cookie cutter approach either on the planning or the investments. Uh, we have a very low client to advisor ratio. Uh, Ritz Carlton service with uh, FedEx efficiency is the way we like to look at it. And uh, you need to find someone who communicates well um, uh, from our weekly emails to monthly statements to uh, more periodic uh, reporting. Uh, we're going to do a, 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 an introductory live well plan, and uh, we're going to try to anticipate your needs. And then there is systematic outbound communication to make sure you know where you are, you're comfortable where you are. And uh, if something is uh, of, uh, of, of worry that uh, it has been addressed and uh, you don't spend a whole weekend worrying about your money. So thank you uh, for, for joining us for your time. Please feel to reach out. Uh, there's contact information for Randy uh, and Matt. Uh, they're in the picture. Maddie, Tiffany, and then on the right-hand side uh, is Melissa, uh, the price group. And uh, we are here and uh, would be more than welcome, uh, no cost or obligation for us spending some time with you. If there's a good fit, we tell folks we'll know it. If it's not a good fit, again, we'll shake hands, part as friends and you'll go away as a, uh, as a consumer more prepared for the uh, uncertainties and the complexities of your retirement planning. So uh, hope uh, you'll join us again. Uh, again, warmer weather coming, so a big smile for that. But uh, thank you for, uh, for being with us this morning. Matt, uh, any questions? None yet, but give us a call, shoot us an email if you have any, and uh, we can go from there. Okay, so on behalf of Matt, Matt Price, I'm Randy Price. We are the Price Group. Everyone needs a wealth coach, and we'll look forward to visiting with you, hopefully in the near future. Thanks, and have a great rest of the day.